very warm welcome to this, the final lecture of our Gifford Lecture Series at the University of Edinburgh for the academic session 2022 to 2023. My name is Stuart Brown. I'm Professor Emeritus of Ecclesiastical History and Vice Convener of the Gifford Lectureships Committee here at Edinburgh. The Gifford Lectures, as I believe you all know by now, are a renowned lecture series for the exploration of natural theology in its widest sense, including the foundations of morals and social ethics. I'm delighted to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor John Dupre, Professor of Philosophy of Science and Consulting Director of the Center for Life Sciences at the University of Exeter. This evening, he concludes what has been a memorable Gifford series on a process perspective on human life. His final lecture is entitled Free Will, and he will be exploring the nature of human agency, our responsibilities to the world, and our capacity to affect meaningful change in a diverse world of processes. Professor Dupre, can I now invite you to give the final lecture of your Gifford series? Throughout these lectures, I've emphasized the deeply social nature of the human species. This may seem inevitably to devalue the human individual. Paradoxically, however, I want to argue that the reverse is the case. It is in large part the social character of the human that makes possible the autonomy of the human individual. In this lecture, I shall try to explain. Mainstream philosophy has an almost contradictory set of views about the individual. In much political philosophy, the autonomous choice of the individual agent is paramount. In political theory, democratic processes aggregate individual decisions. In economic theory, individual preferences determine the production, distribution, and prices of products required to meet human needs and wishes. On the other hand, for centuries, mainstream metaphysics has denied human choice. The doctrine of determinism has been taken to deny the efficacy of the human choices so central in political and economic theory. I admit that this is a contentious description of the situation, so I shall begin this lecture by outlining the debates over free will and determinism and attempting to justify my description. I shall then begin to explain how the process philosophy I have been advocating provides a path out of the problem. Many philosophers, even today, are determinists. The view is less prevalent, I'm pleased to say, among philosophers of science. Many, however, continue to hold that exceptionless physical laws determine everything that happens. When reminded that physics nowadays has eschewed determinism in the theory of quantum mechanics, they will reply that all the indeterminism disappears at larger scales. Schrodinger's cat is an intriguing thought experiment, but in the real macroscopic, macroscopic world, universal law holds sway. I don't propose to discuss in any detail how this curious belief came about, as it should be clear from my lectures to date that I have a very different view of the world. I cannot resist, however, quoting an exceptionally insightful comment from the late Cambridge philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe. She says, the high success of Newton's astronomy was in one way an intellectual disaster. It produced an illusion from which we tend to still to suffer. This illusion was created by the circumstance that Newton's mechanics had a good model in the solar system. For this gave the impression that we had here an ideal of scientific explanation. Whereas the truth was, it was mere obligingness on the part of the solar system by having had so peaceful a history in recorded time to provide such a model. As a therapy against this illusion, I might also recommend Lucy Shin's wonderful science fiction novel, The Three-Body Problem, which, among other things, explores the nature of life on a planet under the chaotic gravitational influence of three suns. 
At any rate, for determinists, it is liable to appear that individual choice is an illusion. The nexus of physical laws determines what happens now, which in turn determines what happens in the future. Similarly, what happens now was foreordained by events that happened long ago. My belief that I choose between the apple and the orange or the hard physical labor and the life of crime is just that, an illusion. For these decisions were determined long ago, perhaps at the moment of the Big Bang. Since David Hume's famous thoughts on this topic, the dominant view has been to embrace this conclusion with equanimity. Hume distinguished between liberty of spontaneity and liberty of indifference. What we imagine we want is the latter, the possibility of acting in either of two or more ways. But why should we want this? When I decide that, all things considered, I prefer the apple, why is it important that I somehow be able to choose the orange? What I should care about is just that my choice reflects my authentic preference, something he, available, he writes, to everyone who is not a prisoner and in chains. One might extend this list to further sources of unfreedom, such as coercion by threats, psychological manipulation, or insanity. But absent some such factor, we are all free to act on our determined preferences. This has become the dominant opinion of contemporary philosophers. In defense of this view, it is often pointed out how little we should care about liberty of indifference. Why should, I be, why should I care about being able to get what I don't want? Another way of thinking about indifference is to imagine that our decisions have an element of randomness to them. But this sounds nothing at all like what I might want if I want to be free. The compatibilist, as followers of Hume's lead are generally known, insists that freedom is precisely the confidence that I will be able to do what I most want to do, something that would be clearly frustrated by an element of randomness. Perhaps it remains surprising that the enemy of, unsurprising, I'm sorry, that the enemy of compatibilism, generally known as the libertarian or voluntarist, remains unsatisfied. What is missing is a sense of actual influence or power. I imagine that my actions make a difference in the world not merely as a conduit for the long-ago determined causal nexus to flow through, but as the actual source of change. This is sometimes connected to the idea of agent causation, according to which the agent is the originator of a causal chain or process. To a philosopher immersed in Hume's causal world, in which causality is precisely the enactment of causal regularity, agent causation is liable to seem distinctly mysterious. Either the agent is located somehow outside the normal causal order, as in a Cartesian soul, or they are an unexplained anomaly, anomaly in an otherwise well-ordered world. Neither alternative seems attractive. I shall suggest, however, that process philosophy offers a way forward. Let me again stress how very different the world I want to describe is from the determinists. As opposed to everything being ordered by universal lawful regularity, I see a background of chaos. Order is something that emerges occasionally under special circumstances and that lasts for a finite period of time. Whereas the voluntarist philosopher typically tries to see the human as an exception of some kind to an otherwise all-encompassing causal order, I see the human as the pinnacle of order, the most intricately stabilized system yet known to have emerged or evolved from the surrounding chaos. Rather than laws, which have, been widely, have widely been recognized as increasingly hard to find, at least in biology, I prefer to think in terms of causal powers, capacities to affect the world in systematic ways that have emerged as complex systems stabilize themselves. Here again, I must make a nod to Hume, who is also famous for convincing many philosophers that causal powers were nonsensical, lacking in any possible empirical grounding. Fortunately, though this debate still rages, there is a solid anti-Humean tradition with which I can align myself. I will again single out Elizabeth Anscombe, Hume, she notes, challenges us to produce some instance wherein the efficacy of a causal power is plainly discoverable to the mind and its operations obvious to our consciousness or sensation. Nothing easier. 
is cutting, is drinking, is purring, not efficacy. Once again, as in earlier lectures, we see the power of a framework to determine what we see. I see the rain washing the dirt off my car. I see the dog gnawing on a bone. I see the boy catching a ball. Everywhere entities, that is processes, interact and bring about changes in one another. But suppose I think the world I see is a world composed wholly of discrete things. Then perhaps I will see a ball moving through the air. Then I see it reaching the boundaries of the boy's hand. Then I see that it no longer moves. Do I see the boy's hand making the ball stop? Surely this is not something I see in addition to what I just described. So perhaps as Hume would say, it is something added by my mind. Suppose instead I see the world as full of activity process. I see these processes intersecting, the rain and my dirty car, the dog and the bone, the boy and the boar, and affecting one another. This, I suggest, is just what causation is, and we see it all the time. This is why, as Anscombe's response illustrates, our descriptive language is laden with causality. Our constructed world is full of things we describe in terms of their causal powers. Knives cut, tables support, radiators warm, ovens cook, and so on. And adjectives that qualify these powers, sharp knives cut more easily, wobbly tables support unreliably, air-locked radiators fail to warm. Unsurprisingly, though, it is verbs, action words, that are the most process-filled. Verbs describe processes, thinking, walking, boiling, singing, and causal interactions, touching, throwing, lifting, digging, breaking, pushing, and countless others. These activities are powers that the entities we observe have and powers we sometimes observe them exercising. In some, then, unless we adopt an ontological frame that excludes the observation of the exercise of powers, this is something that we observe constantly. So, in this chaotic world, we have entities, processes, with causal powers. Again, we can contrast the two worldviews. In the traditional metaphysics, the equivalents of causal powers are the law-like regularities to which things are subject. If a thing is complex, these regularities are consequent on the regularities that apply to its components. This gives rise to the idea of a machine, the parts of which are organized so as to bring about a regular behavior. When I press the switch, the blades and the fruit pacer ro processor rotate rapidly, for instance. Most of the time, the machine just waits patiently for the switch to be pressed. Unlike the machine, a process acts constantly to maintain itself and its structure. Whether or not the structure explains its behavior, like the machine, the behavior also explains the structure. Evolution has generated processes that are extremely good at maintaining their structure, and we need to look at the kinds of causal powers that have enabled them to do this. While I have admitted to some skepticism about the kind of openness of behavior suggested by Hume's liberty of indifference, it does point to something that might help understand the problem of free will, which is the indeterminacy of outcome. This is something that is almost always seen as a failing in a, machi in a machine, but something of this sort seems to be implicated in our conception of freedom. Indeterminacy is not, of course, the same as variability. I can imagine a machine that identifies animals. When it is in the vicinity of a rabbit, it types rabbit. When a fox approach, it types fox. Its behavior is variable, but we hope determinate. We hope that it will always type the same words when confronted by at least a particular type of rabbit. Much animal behavior is often interpreted in just this way. One central paradigm for mechanical animal behavior is the sphex wasp, observations of which date from Jean-Henri Fabre in the 19th century, but which have become a standby of discussion in philosophy of science and cognitive science, especially due to the work of the philosopher Daniel Dennett. This wasp, like many other related species, provisions a nest for its larvae with the paralyzed body of another insect, in this case a cricket. The sphex typically brings its prey to the entrance of a prepared burrow. 
checks the state of the burrow, and then comes back up to drag in the victim. Here is Fabre's account of his famous observation of the wasp, in this case, Sphex flavi penis. At the moment when the Sphex, this is the quote, at the moment when the Sphex is making her domiciliary visit, I take the cricket left at the entrance to the dwelling and place her a few inches farther away. The Sphex comes up, utters her usual cry, looks here and there in astonishment, and, seeing the game too far off, comes out of her hole to seize it and bring it back to its right place. Having done this, she goes down again, but alone. I play the same trick upon her, and the Sphex has the same disappointment on her arrival at the entrance. The victim is once more dragged back to the edge of the hole, but the wasp always goes down alone, and this goes on as long as my patience is not exhausted. Time after time, 40 times over, did I repeat the same experiment on the same wasp. Her persistence vanquished mine, and her tactics never varied. It is concluded that Sphex's behavior is a wholly mechanical routine. Place cricket at entrance to the nest, check condition of nest, drag cricket in. If the routine is disrupted, the cricket simply tries again to execute it. This story has been cited repeatedly in support of mechanistic accounts of animal behavior. Unfortunately, as is shown in a rather more thorough examination of the history of research on these wasps by Dutch philosopher Fred Kaiser, the example is poorly chosen. Not only subsequent research, but even research by Farb himself shows that this observation is far from universally true of the wasp. A few lines below the text just quoted, he writes, having demonstrated the same inflexible obstinacy which I have described in the case of all the Sphex wasps on whom I cared to experiment in the same colony, I continued to worry my head over it for some time. What I asked myself was this, does the insect obey a fatal tendency which no circumstance can ever modify? Are its actions all performed by rule, and has it no power of acquiring the least experience on its own account? Good fortune brought me into the presence of another colony of Sphex wasps in a district of some distance from the first. I recommenced my attempts. After two or three experiments with results similar to those which I'd so often obtained, the Sphex got astride of the cricket, seized him with their mandibles by the antennae, and at once dragged him into her burrow. At the other holes, her neighbors likewise, one sooner, another later, discovered my treachery and entered the dwelling with the game, instead of persisting in abandoning it on the threshold to seize it afterwards. Kaiser concludes that the Sphex teaches us more about philosophers and cognitive science scientists than about insects. A model of an entirely mechanistic insect can provide either a contrast with our own condition or an illustration of that condition, depending on the taste of the researcher. What Kaiser shows, however, is that while Sphex may not be the smartest creature around, it is often able to see what it is doing and improve its route to the goal. This leads us to a slightly different conversion of the contrast between mechanism and process, that between mechanism and agent. Let me restate the problem of free will from an explicitly mechanistic perspective. A mechanism, when it is working, is a system in which the properties of the part determine the behavior of the whole. So, if I am a machine, either the properties of my parts cause me to act a certain way, or they don't. In the first case, I am caused to act merely because of the arrangement of my parts, so I am not free. In the latter case, either chance or something external to me determines my behavior. So again, I am not free. But a process is not like this at all. It has changing properties, and it is of the nature of many processes, notably living ones, to change the world around them. Think of the damage done by a paradigmatic process, a storm. A machine can be used to do damage, of course, but it is not of its nature to do so, as it is of a storm. Left to itself, it will generally do nothing. An organism is a great deal more complicated and organized than a storm, but in a consequently more targeted way, all organisms constantly change their environments. 
You might compare the damage done by the storm to the, that inflicted by an elephant or a tiger on respectively flora and fauna. But though we may speak metaphorically of a storm as an agent of change or destruction, no one seriously thinks a storm is an agent. The status of tigers and elephants in this regard is more contentious. What I want to suggest is that we think of agency as pertaining to some degree to anything that has goals and acts to further them. A, so a storm certainly has no goals. More debatable, perhaps, is the case of a thermostat. But I don't think a thermostat has goals or interests. Though it has a tendency to achieve a certain state, this is not its goal. It serves the interests of the people who made or use it. Similarly, though an immune system can respond in very subtle ways to the contingencies of its environment, it has no goals distinct from that of the organism of which it is part. But we might think of even a very simple organism, such as a bacterium, swimming in the direction of a chem chemical gradient towards an environment more favorable to its survival as an agent. All organisms, one might say, have an interest in survival and act in ways that promote that interest. Concerns about the future of robots or even computer programs offer, often center on the possibility that they might acquire goals of their own, goals potentially in conflict with those of their makers. They might, that is to say, become agents. Living systems are typically opportunistic. All, or almost all, have the capacity to respond to the unpredictable contingencies of a changing environment in ways that may maintain their stability, that is to say, survival. This is a capacity that one should expect to be favored by natural selection. It is possible that the best way to deal with the world is mechanistically, as Dennett imagined the Sphex to do. But as the smarter Sphexes quickly illustrate, it is possible to do better than organisms generally do. If entomologists became a common enough, common enough nuisance to the life world of Sphexes, it is likely that they would soon evolve to become smarter. Actually, it appears that even the more repetitive Sphexes may not be so dumb. Kaiser reports a number of more recent studies on the behavior of similar species, concluding with a very extensive study over five years by Jane Brockman on the Sphex species Sphex ichneumonius. On the basis of this work, she concludes that where responses show stereotypy, such as in repeated prey and retrievals, there is an obvious adaptive explanation. Specifically, she notes, the fixity of repeatedly repositioning and re-entering the nest is almost certainly an adaptive response to prey that can easily become lodged in the nest if pulled in backwards. In some probably rare cases, behavioral rigidity is adaptive, and systems may develop in this mechanistic way. But this is a bad model for bio biological systems generally, perhaps rather as a solar system is a bad model for dynamical systems generally. When plasticity is adaptive, systems will generally develop flexible, minimally agentive ways of interacting with their environment. And it seems both empirically and as a matter of common sense that plasticity is very frequently adaptive. As Kaiser goes on to remark, the moral of research on these insects seems to be the opposite of that usually drawn from it. Where there is a benefit to it, animals have generally adopted flexible behavior. So many organisms, perhaps all, exhibit a kind of agency, at least in the fairly undemanding sense that I've given the term but perhaps we should make the concept a bit more demanding. The Sphex, after all, even given Dennett's conception of it, let's call it the D-Sphex, responds adaptively to its environment. When it comes out of its nests and finds the grasshopper where it should be, it pulls it down into the nest. When it sees some way away, sees it some way away, it pulls it back to the nest. Both of these are adaptive responses to the environment. In the second case, uh, in, in the second case, it then makes a pointless trip down into the nest, but no one is perfect. The problem with the d 
is that its behavior is entirely determined by its environment. Whether its behavior serves its goals is irrelevant. Of course, if it's lucky, it will have evolved so that the deterministic response to the environment is generally a good one. But that is no part of why it acts that way. That is solely to be explained by the lucky behavior of its ancestors that enabled them to be ancestors. But the artifex, are for real, is not so simple. When its circumstances change, it is sometimes able to change its behavior in ways that are more appropriate to its goals. Something like this provides a more demanding but plausible condition for minimal agency. Am I saying that the Arsfex has free will? Let me sidestep that question for a moment and just look a bit further into agentiality. I've said that being an agent is a matter of degree. A thermostat has none, or almost none, a bacterium has very little, and a human has a lot. What are the variables that contribute to greater agentiality? First, agents have a goal of some kind. They have preference, preferences about how the world should be, and their actions have some tendency to make the world that way. Subject to some doubts about preferences, this criterion might even attribute some minimal agency to thermostats. Second, agents learn. Their capacity to respond to the environment is a function of preceding experience with similar environmental contingencies. This is a permissive criterion, and it is beginning to seem that it may well apply to a great many organisms. Learning is, of course, most studied in animals, but a number of scientists now believe that plants can learn from experience, though this does remain controversial. Artificial intelligence systems also certainly qualify, reinforcing the unsurprising point that artificial intelligence has some features in common with natural intelligence. More traditional machines, pumps, toasters, lawnmowers, etc., surely don't learn, though in a minimal sense, computers surely do. I am the most salient part of the environment for my laptop, and on the basis of its interactions with me, it is able to show files, run programs that I've installed, and so on. Since an increasing proportion of machines now contain computers, I suppose that many of these are acquiring minimal capacities to learn. Perhaps a more interesting point here is that an evolving limit lineage might claim to satisfy this criterion of agentiality on the basis of learning by natural selection. Something like this might justify the claim that bacteria learn for example, to combat antimicrobial chemicals. It is not generally suggested that individual bacteria learn how to do this, though one might perhaps think that they could learn from their neighbors through the process of lateral gene transfer. But the rapid generation times of bacterial colonies, together with the genetic resources that may be distributed through a local population, allow evolution by natural selection to provide a rapid response to a novel environmental challenge within a bacterial lineage. This also connects with the debate whether the individual bacterial cell, or rather the colony of many cells, is more appropriately seen as the organism. Third, agents exhibit some degree of creativity. Again, I don't want to make this concept very demanding. Indeed, it might be that it is no more than any behavior that is not a purely instinctive and deterministic response to a stimulus. But I do want to add some level of appropriateness that distinguishes creative behavior from the merely random. The aspect is being creative when it brings the cricket back from where the experimenter has put it and drags it into its nest. It would, at any rate, be a different kind of response if it had, say, dragged it another meter from the nest tossed it in the air, and abandoned it. It might be the case, I suppose, that creativity consisted, for some creatures, merely in generating random actions and observing whether any of them were conducive to its goals. But this seems a rather bad way to act and immediately suggests a fourth and more ambitious feature of agentiality, perhaps well-developed only in animals with reasonably complex nervous systems, foresight, and ultimately intelligence. Some agents are able to imagine the consequences of novel actions 
drawing on experience, or in the human case at least, socially transmitted knowledge. They thus have some insight into the likely value of novel responses to contingencies. Combined with the ability to learn from the outcomes of novel behavior, we are getting close to a rudimentary experimental method. An animal that can discern potentially value, valuable forms of behavior and evaluate their results has an extraordinary capacity. Such foresight is certainly not unique to humans, though it may well be rare. New Caledonian crows, for instance, have become famous for their tool-using abilities and seem able to see several steps ahead in devising solutions to quite complex problems. I don't much care whether this is an account of agentiality that fits well with standard appeals to the concept, or even in the present context, whether it has wide applicability throughout the living world. Here, I'm mostly interested in describing features of the human that differentiate the human processes from the kinds of desvexic, mechanistic, stimulus response behavior still often thought to apply to everything up to and perhaps including human action. Recalling my earlier identification of agent causation, the possibility of causal chains that originate in the agent, I've tried to sketch something of the kind of agent to whom such a capacity might plausibly be attributed. It is time to go into a bit more detail as to how this might work. Let me first remind you that I am envisaging a world in which order, causal or otherwise, is an exceptional condition rather than an all-pervasive background. Persistent or continuant processes create much of the order that they exhibit. In some cases, what I have called agents, they may be the origin of causal chains, and these often serve to promote their persistence. If an organism is a process with capacities to respond to external contingencies in effective and even sometimes novel ways, then it is a source of causal processes in roughly the sense of agent causation. When I describe behavior as effective here, I do not mean in the technical sense adaptive, simply conducive to the familiar evolutionary ends of survival and reproduction. I mean whatever ends the organism may have. Frequently, these do involve the creation or maintenance of some kind of order conducive to the well-being of the organism. The self-evident fact, however, that humans have a great many aims, most of which have no connection or a certainly immediate connection to biological competition, is a central reason why sociobiology and evolutionary psychology have generally seemed hopelessly simplistic approaches to understanding the human. So humans have many distinct goals, depending at least on their place in society and the division of labor. Farmers will have goals connected with food production, politicians occasionally with a well-run society, scientists and philosophers with an understanding of the world, and so on. Any of these people may have multiple other goals, from a golf handicap of 75 to playing the accordion, from memorizing the Bible to improving the lives of domestic chickens. And here, I suggest, we find the highest level of agency, perhaps unique to humans in our world. It is by virtue of acting in ways conducive to the achievement of these multiple goals that humans are most distinctively sources of causal power or free agents. How does all this connect with the difficulties with free will outlined at the beginning of this lecture? Part of the traditional difficulty was with seeing humans as somehow exceptions to an otherwise seamless web of deterministic causality, a view that has rightly seemed metaphysically desperate. But I propose to reverse this. There is no seamless web of causal order, but a background of disorder out of which threads of partial order here and there emerge. Humans are exceptions to the general disorder and lawliness of the, lawlessness of the universe, not unique exceptions, but nevertheless, I suggest, we are the densest concentrations of causal power in the known universe. Certainly, 
there is room to better understand the way that causal order emerges from the surrounding disorder. But understanding the human condition is continuous with this project rather than an exception to it. If this seems surprising, think for a moment of how extraordinarily predictable humans are. If I arrange you to meet you for a cup of coffee at a particular time and place three weeks from now, I'm fairly confident that you will be there, even if you have been all over the world in between. Think what a remarkable achievement this is. It would be even more remarkable in a, det in a deterministic world. Think of all the calculations required, and only becomes seriously possible in a malleable world in which the predictable entity can constantly adjust its behavior to emerging contingencies. So can this view escape the apparently watertight dilemma of human action being either causally explicable and thus not open to any alternative or randomly generated and thus in no way attributable to the agent? Watertight because any react relaxation of the causal explicability of the action seems only to introduce an unwanted element of randomness. I don't think this dilemma can be escaped entirely, but I think it can be rendered relatively innocuous. What it does show is that there is an important truth to compatibilism. Humans really cannot escape the causal order, whatever that is. If, as I argue, causal order is rare, but humans are replete with it, this does not, obviously, put humans outside that order. But if the causality that generates our action is our own capacity to impose order on our world, then I don't think we should be very concerned. The order that constrains us is largely of our own making. But the recurrent dilemma still won't go quietly. Much of the concern here comes from questions of responsibility, credit, and blame. I perform a noble or vile act and perhaps deserve credit or blame. If I could not have done otherwise, is this desert justified? The problem is that even if I could have done otherwise, it is far from obvious how this helps. Why did I do what I did, whether or not I could have refrained? The unhelpful dichotomy of cause and chance still confronts us. We begin to make progress, I think, by distinguishing between kinds of motivation. To the extent that I do exactly and only just what I feel moved to do at the moment, following whatever urges I may have, I see no very interesting use for the distinction between free and unfree action. But processes can contribute to shaping themselves. A river may erode a bank, thereby providing a quicker route to the ocean, for example. Humans, rather more interestingly, shape their path through the world with decisions on goals and policies. If I decide to go to the gym three times a week, perhaps to improve my physical fitness, I plan to constrain my choices. When I decide whether to stay in bed another hour or stick to my plan of going to the gym, I make a real choice. The ability to do not what I'm currently moved to do, stay in bed, but what I'm committed to doing, go to the gym, seems to me the interesting exercise of freedom. As a process creating a path of order through a chaotic world, I'm able to choose some part of the order I impose. This connects free will most clearly with the general theme of these lectures. The history of the universe and the history of life as a vital phase in that history is one of the emergence of order from chaos. But the stable, ordered processes that have emerged during this long history are not merely the consequences of some now complete process, but are also the causes of further emergence of order. The emergence of hydrogen and helium atoms, stars, heavier atoms, organic molecules, cells, multicellular organisms, and so on, have all brought with them new capacities that have made possible new forms of organization. The human capacity to acquire understanding of the workings of the world and fundamentally reorganize it if, sadly, now in directions threatening great harm to ourselves, is a new stage in this gradual emergence of causal powers. Many distinctively human powers can be exercised by the person who simply does that which they feel most strongly inclined to do at the present moment. 
But most of what is uniquely human, the building of railway lines and skyscrapers, the discovery of the structure of matter and so on, is possible only through commitment to override the desires of the moment. And incidentally, I'll return to this, through massive cooperation. This idea is clearly related to Kant's view that only in acting in accordance with moral duty am I free. But my view is much more tolerant than Kant as to what kinds of principle or goals can, as he puts it, provide a maxim for my action. And I offer no view on whether there is an objective duty to which I am subject. What my view shares with Kant is the perhaps paradoxical idea that is limiting my possible action in accordance with some larger ambition for my life that provides freedom. freedom. An obvious advantage of this view that this view shares with Kant's more austere position is that it properly relates freedom of the will with the will, something that can be trained and cultivated and something that can be subject to strength or weakness. A strong will is what enables one to align one's behavior with one's principles and goals rather than one's first ordered desires. It is by doing so that humans and perhaps some an other animals impose new forms of order in the disordered world. I said the recurrent question had been pushed back, but it does not go away. Where do my principles and goals come from? The answer, I take it, is from a combination of upbringing, perhaps genetic luck and experience. But I did not choose these. So can I claim any credit for either the admirable or contemptible principles that guide my actions or the actions that these evoke? I think that with one important proviso, this is close to where the defense of freedom must end. We admire strength of will and good character, but it is questionable whether we should give credit, people credit for these in the way we do for actions and courses of action. Similarly, we admire natural talents, whether athletic or intellectual, without properly giving people credit for them. The proviso is that in addition to endowments that are a matter of luck, people are, to some important degree, self-creating. Self-cultivation, as has been noted at least since Aristotle, is a vital aspect of human lives, and some such things as will are certainly, to some degree, products of this. But yet again, the ability to cultivate the self is itself something that must depend in large part on accidents of origin. How much of this is a variable within individual control is an undoubtedly a crucial question in moral psychology, but not one I shall attempt to pursue here beyond noting that it is surely something that belongs firmly within the remit of process philosophy. I want to conclude with one very important point about human agency. I have spoken of the various projects that can shape the second order desires that differentiate the free agent from the consistent follower of the desire of the moment. I have in mind a vast array of such projects from the pursuit of learning or spiritual insight to building houses or roads to curing illnesses and teaching the young. With regard to any of these, it is crucial to recall the points I have stressed before on the cooperative nature of the human species. Any of these projects, even the most self-directed, depends on the contribution of innumerable fellow humans, whether in providing us the means of existence in food, housing, or clothing, the means of development into competent adult humans through teaching, medical provision, and such like, or the material infrastructure of housing, transport, and much else. The possibility of self-cultivation with which I ended the main discussion of human freedom is itself something entirely dependent on all of these social inputs. The point of all this is that freedom is, in the end, a social construct. I do not mean here, as so often and strangely seems to be taken as an interpretation of social construction, not real. Society is real, and construction is generally at least a way of making things real. I mean rather that the freedom we enjoy is not to be understood primarily as the expression of the essence of a unique individual, but as the realization by the individual of something the enabling conditions of which are overwhelmingly social. As I've mentioned at several points in these lectures, 
A key conclusion of the processual perspective on human life is that the emphasis on the isolated individual that has been such a central feature of so much Western thought for the last few centuries is seriously misguided. I do not mean that we should not cherish the uniqueness and unique contributions of the individual, but we should also remember how the ability to enjoy these things is entirely dependent on a functioning society. Indeed, I've contrasted the pursuit of grander goals with the submission to passing desire, but the ability to make this choice is always contingent on the background of passing wants, food, water, clothing, shelter, being generally provided. There is little freedom for the destitute. Freedom is a luxury for the reserve for those with access to the benefits of a functioning society. Perhaps this should diffuse some of the, our worries at the unanswered questions at the end of the discussion of individual free will. Certainly, it should reinforce the awareness that the grossly unequal distribution of resources in contemporary societies is not only wholly unjustified by the difference in individual contributions, but also damaging to the prospects for rewarding lives for most of us. Having come near the end of the final lecture in this series, it is in, perhaps in order for me to summarize very briefly where I have been. I started with the broadest possible question about the universe generally. What kinds of entities does it contain? I argued that a very plausible view of the universe was of one in which partially ordered and stable processes, processes with novel causal powers, emerged from a chaotic background. I then turned to life and argued in much greater detail that this picture of the emergence of partially stable processes was the correct way to understand this remarkable phenomenon. I first argued this for the case of organisms and then for the slightly less familiar case of lineages, the long-lasting process in which evolution occurs. One important point of this exercise was to question assumptions about these entities that derive not from empirical data but from bad metaphysics. So, for example, that idea that an individual or a species has an essential property, the assumption that there are sharp boundaries, both spatial and temporal, to an organism, that organisms are largely autonomous, and so on, are all ideas that derive from the metaphysics of substance, but actually contradict the deliverances of empirical sciences. Having established, to the best of my ability, the conclusion that life was a realm of mutually intertwined and stabling process, stabilizing processes, I explored the implication that we ourselves, humans, must also be processes. This exploration was divided into three main parts. First, I looked at the boundaries of the individual human, both spatial but even more temporal, and the vagueness of these in a world of process. I suggested that these provided fresh insight into traditional questions about personal identity. Second, I looked at the classification of humans and the skepticism about such classifications engendered by a process perspective. And third, today, I've explored the implications of a process ontology for the ancient question of freedom of the will. Throughout these investigations, I have mainly tried to stick to evidence-based argument. As a philosopher, I do not mean to downplay the argument part of this methodology, but I also want to insist that where contingent propositions about the world are concerned, we should defer to the evidence and, with due caution, this generally means deferring to science. But as my reflections come to an end, I would like to take a rather different turn and admit that one reason I am drawn to defend a process ontology is that I find it portrays a much more appealing world than its more traditional alternative. While I have tried to convince you of the inescapability of process philosophy by argument, of course, there are always also less purely rational reasons why we hold particular views. And I confess that I like the process world. Why? Billiard ball science and metaphysics as I refer to the substance view of things with deliberate abuse, describes a world of necessity. Science tells us how things are and have to be. Sometimes, as in cases such as neoclassical economics or evolutionary psychology, 
the necessity is oppressive. We cannot make a fairer society, we are told, for example, because we are prevented by the facts of human nature or the iron laws of economics. Process science is a science of possibility. Processes evolve, and their evolution is affected by many factors. There are very many things in the present world that are not as we would wish them to be, and process science can perhaps tell us how we might help them to get better. It may not be easy, but neither is it ruled out from the start by philosophical argument. This is surely a more attractive and encouraging view of the world. How fortunate that it is also true. It's now my honor, on behalf of the Gifford Committee, to offer some concluding remarks by way of appreciation to Professor Dupre for his superb series of Gifford Lectures for the academic session 2022-23. to Now more than 134 years old, the Gifford Lectureship at the University of Edinburgh has featured some of the world's most renowned scholar teachers in a shared project of enhancing our understanding of natural theology and the foundations of ethics. Professor Dupre has brought added luster to this distinguished company of Gifford lecturers. His Gifford lectures on a process perspective on human life have offered valuable interpretations of our universe and our human condition. He is a philosopher of science and his wide-ranging lectures have been interdisciplinary in the highest sense, drawing from the natural sciences, especially the life sciences, as well as philosophy, psychology, anthropology, history, and literature. Lectures have been beautifully crafted and eloquently presented with pertinent illustrations and an engaging sense of humor. He's been generous in responding to our questions and to our blogs. In his lectures, Professor Dupre has drawn on the results of scientific research to show that all life is a process and that our world is made up not of essential substances or things arranged into mechanisms, but rather of a vast array of processes in fluid, dynamic interaction and continuous change. We live, he maintained, not in a world of things, but in a world of processes. And in this world, there are no sharp boundaries and nothing is fixed or static. There's, an, there's the apparent chaos of subatomic and atomic particles and continuous movement. There is a bewildering array of life forms interconnected and interdependent from simple microbes to majestic groves of trees with shared root systems. He's considered organisms and he has considered lineages of evolving organisms against the background of a fluid, dynamic, often chaotic world. Both organisms and lineages are best understood, he tells us, as open-ended processes. Our scientific knowledge of organisms and lineages, he's shown, raises profound questions of identity. A human body has hosted trillions of microbes, viruses, and bacteria, some necessary to the survival of the host, some pathological, some neutral. Over half the cells in our bodies are non-human. Each human organism is an interdependent community. And in adapting to the environment, human lineages construct niches, social structures, and organizations that are interconnected and interdependent with other organisms. The problem for humanity as Professor Dupre has shown, is that for most of us, our worldview, our conception of the universe, does not reflect 
the fluidity, dynamism, interconnectedness, and interdependence of the natural world of processes. We tend to think in terms of essential properties, things, mechanisms, autonomous individuals. Our predominantly capitalist economic order is largely based on individualism, competition, exploitation of nature, and acceptance of gross inequalities, which has relegated much of the world's population to poverty and deprivation. Many people insist on individual rights to do whatever they want, relishing self-assertion and dominance. Many believe that race or ethnic nationality are essential human properties. They want to maintain hard borders and boundaries and vilify migrants. Some insist that there are only two genders, refusing to recognize the biological fluidity of sex gender identities and marginalizing and abusing those who do not conform. And the result? A world of division and oppression with a real prospect, a very real prospect through climate change or nuclear war, of catastrophic destruction of much of humankind with immense collateral damage to other life forms. But for Professor Dupre, this is not determined. A process ontology, he believes, with its conception of organisms and lineages as open-ended processes, shows us a world not only of constant change and diversity, but also of free agency and different pathways. Process science, he tells us, is a science of possibility. And this includes the possibility of our human lineage adapting better to our changing environment and building better forms of social order in which more of us might flourish. When we conceive of humans as open-ended processes, we open the possibility of being better than we now are. Professor Dupre has given us a memorable Gifford lecture series calling us to new conceptions of our world, a process ontology that can help in preserving this world, and our human lineage in all its astonishing diversity and beauty. There are many to thank this evening. On behalf of the Gifford Committee, let me express our gratitude to the University of Exeter and the National Institute for the Humanities and Social Science at Stellenbosch University for their support to, Dupre, to Professor Dupre as he's prepared these, these lectures. We also wish to thank the chairpersons of the individual lectures in this series the bloggers who have prepared their informed, thoughtful, critical commentaries on each lecture, the panelists in our Royal Society of Edinburgh Gifford seminar yesterday, and the technical experts and support people that have helped so much. Let me express a special appreciation to Ms. Louise Trotter and Ms. Nicola Cruikshank, our Gifford administrators, and to Ms. Victoria Turner, our Gifford social media host. They have worked so hard for this series, often well into the night. And we also thank the audiences for your attention, your thoughtful questions, and your blog comments. But above all, we thank our Gifford lecturer. It's been a great pleasure to have John Dupre with us in Edinburgh these past two weeks. We hope that there will be many more Scottish visits in the coming years. 
We wish him a safe trip back to Exeter. But again, John, our very warmest thanks for a superb series of Gifford Lectures.